Okay, I go uh, in order uh, from here. Uh, uh, Candy is uh, replacing uh, Johan Wickland, who is unable to be here, who, the chief editor. Candy is, works at Babson, and we're delighted to have Candy here. And next to Candy, we have Sharon. She's going to talk about theory and AMR. Sharon can talk all day about theory, and it's great to have Sharon here. And I've had these conversations since I was a doctoral student uh, with Sharon on theory. Right? Thank you, Sharon. Mark, as, uh, if I spend time introducing all the editors, it'll take too long. Mark is at AMJ, and his CV and his achievements are remarkable, including winning the Entrepreneurship Researcher of the Year Award and decade-long entrepreneurship research performance. Thank you, Mark. And we have, uh, sorry, we have Melissa representing SEJ and then Jeff uh, representing the heart and soul of entrepreneurship journals as well here uh, seated together, right? Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Mark, Sharon, and Candy. In any order, please, you could start off and you can come up here and speak and say, what are you looking for in entrepreneurship papers from your journal and from your perspective? The mic's here. If you prefer to, or I can hand over this to you. We try. We are Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh well. I don't know. Is this is this going to work for you? <laughs> so uh, we decided to sit down because it's a little bit more informal this way than if we stand up and actually lecture to you. So, Candy Brush, Babson College, and I'm I'm a senior editor at Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice. And um, Johan Wicklin is the new executive editor. Um, Johan came um, into ETP editorship in January. Um, the journal had been edited by Ray Bagby for about 30 years. Does anybody know how old entrepreneurship theory and practice is? Anybody? No? It was founded in 1976 as the American Journal of Small Business. And so it's actually one of the older journals in the field. Um, we, we publish papers on a variety of topics. Um, the mission statement is on the website, and if you are interested in ETNP, please go to the, the website, look at the mission statement. Um, we publish papers on everything from small business to entrepreneurial opportunity to entrepreneurial orientation, the whole list of different topics. You can sort of see what it looks like. Um, generally speaking, um, the process at ETP, um, we have, um, one senior, we have Johan as a senior editor, four executive, four senior editors, and we have 22 other editors who manage the manuscripts. Um, last year, we had 200, 580 uh, submissions, and we accepted about 8% of the papers. Um, the impact factor of ETP right now is 5.31, so it's, it's a good journal, it's risen. And our average review time has gone down to about 60 days, so you get a decision pretty quickly. Um, we have a couple of special issues coming up, um, one on theories and family business, one on entrepreneurship and biology, one on entrepreneurship and the sharing economy, stakeholder theory and entrepreneurship and digitization and entrepreneurial finance. And so I'll stop and pass it on to Sharon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm here. I'm an associate editor at uh, Academy of Management Review, AMR. And we have the uh, editor-in-chief who just walked in, so now I have to be really careful with my <laughs> statistics. Um, but I don't want to bore you too much with the statistics. I, we're a great journal, so I'll leave it at that. We're a great journal. Submit your great work to us. Um, we'd love to publish it. But that's the thing. We would love to publish it. And the thing that I think is so exciting right now at AMR, the changes that have been made at AMR, is you now have an associate editor that's from the field of entrepreneurship that you can submit papers to, um, and you can decide whether you get a fair review or not, but you can submit papers to. Um, and that's really exciting. And I will ask for confirmation, I think in terms of just raw submission growth, entrepreneurship has been number one. So we're getting more and more entrepreneurship papers. It's a great thing to have. We just had a special issue, a uh, special theory issue, which just um, got through closing. In fact, I probably let the last scraggler in today. Um, but again, it was on uncertainty, which I think absolutely has an entrepreneurial sort of flavor to it, if you will, uh, influence. And um, 
either number one or number two, I think, in terms of, of total submissions to a special issue in AMR's history. So I'm being kind of Trump-like right now, but that's okay. Um, so, so the good news is AMR is open for business. It's open for business for entrepreneurship. We love to see your papers. Um, don't send me crappy papers, please, oh, please, oh, please. Um, so we have like a 27% desk reject at the editor's level, at, at the chief editor, and um, at the associate editor, we have another 10% rejection. I really want to publish entrepreneurship papers, so that's why I tell you, please, oh, please, oh, please, see what's being published, understand how it's being published, understand what we're looking for. And there's different ways of thinking about this. You don't have to have, um, there's propositional types of theories, and there's theories that aren't propositional, and we're open for business on that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. There's Lots of things to echo from AMJ's side. Uh, we are the empir empirical sister of AMR, uh, which means we are soliciting empirical papers, but they should have a strong theoretical contribution. And uh, compared to the uh, field journals, JBV, SCJ, ETP, and others, we are general management journals, just like Chris Tucci will talk about AMD in a minute, which means the paper should be relevant, should speak to ideally a broader audience, because think about the academy, all the different divisions we have here. Uh, when you want to publish an AMJ or any general management journal, it's, it's, it's good advice to frame your paper in a way that allows you to, to speak to multiple audiences. And I think that's one of the key differences among when you write a paper for one or the other outlet, meaning a specialist journal or a general management journal. And both can have great impact. I know it's, it's, it's just a different type of impact you probably have. And uh, it's a different type of paper you need to craft you know, from the introduction up to the contributions. Uh, we probably have time to talk about this later on. We have 18 associate editors, two to three handle typically manuscripts in innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, so that's a significant number. We had the previous editor was Jerry George, he was an entrepreneurship innovation scholar, so he left definitely his mark in, on, the, on the journal. Um, I'm serving as a deputy editor there. We have two deputy editors, so, so entrepreneurship in that sense is since a longer time represented in the, in the leadership of the journal, which also is reflective, obviously, then in the, the types of papers we get, because people say, well, that's an entrepreneurship scholar who's, who's on that board, or several ones. Uh, they can competently judge my work. So I really want to encourage you to send your best work, if it's empirical, and you want to publish in a journal management journal to us. And with that, I hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. I'm a little hiding here behind the podium. <laughs> Maybe I'll stand up. Um, uh, I, I'm Chris Tucci. Uh, I'm at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, along with Mark here. Um, and I am here to tell you about a little bit about Academy of Management Discoveries. I apologize. I've, um, the scheduling system quadruple booked me for this session. <laughs> so I actually am running around like a little ping pong ball from place to place. And I'll, I'll have to leave as soon as I make my pitch. But let me make my pitch. Let me just say that, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult in the management area in general to publish phenomenological research, so studying a phenomenon, which I think is very important in entrepreneurship. On the other hand, it's not so easy to convince people that you're making a theoretical contribution when you're studying something new. And I can give you the own, my own example of, uh, I've, I was very, I still am, very interested in corporate venture capital. And uh, I, you know, had all these papers, collected all this data on corporate venture capital, and trying to understand different aspects of it. What are the benefits to the to the recipient, et cetera, et cetera? And I got, you know, many, many rejections, basically saying that's a prominent partner. We already know, so we don't care. All we know is that a startup has a prominent partner. It's good for them. So case closed. And even though I thought, well, this is really interesting, you know, companies taking equity stakes in these companies. So, so you know, it's, it, it's in other fields, it's absolutely normal <laughs> to have, in, in many other fields, it's, it's normal to have phenomenological research. Um, some of the most impactful articles in other fields are actually measurement articles uh, and, and without knowing in advance the underlying mechanisms of what's going on. So you may have a hunch. And so that's why we, in AMD, we take the approach of abductive approach, trying to explore the phenomenon and trying to figure out a plausible explanation, rule out other plausible explanations, and then 
eventually discuss the theoretical implications toward the end. Um, and in most cases, it's not desirable to retrofit hypotheses once you know what your results are, right? And, and so in, 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 uh, in some cases, people will collect data, they're interested in the topic, and then, you know, certain people will actually then, okay, let's see, what kind of hypotheses can I generate that would be consistent with this? <laughs> Worse, sometimes the referees will say, hey, I've got a better theory for you that fits your, your results much better, you know? <laughs> so, so, so in this case of AMD, you don't need to do any of that, right? We're not interested in the, in the, in the hypothesis testing part of it, and that's the sort of so-called abductive approach. It means that you basically have this hunch, why did you collect the data in the first place? And then what are you going to do? With, and then what are you going to do with it? And and how can you rule out all the different explanations by doing some a variety of empirical tests? So that's the that's the approach that we're that we're doing. We have we have six or seven editors. I happen to be one of the people who handles the technology innovation management, entrepreneurship, and strategy type papers. Um, Georg von Krog just joined uh, this month, and so he'd be another type of another editor who would be uh, inclined to receiving entrepreneurship type papers. Um, and uh, uh, and, and, and we have uh, a few other editors who also handle different kinds of methods, um, experimental methods, qualitative research, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a wide variety of people who can handle it. Um, and then finally, I just want to say we have some special issues coming, including one on digitalization. And some of you who might be interested in that, uh, you can send me a message or come to our special session on Monday where we actually sit around with authors and, and, and talk about the special issue and you can pitch ideas to the editors of the special issue. So I think it's Monday at 115 or something like that. So let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you. Uh, so hello. Um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal. So Academy of Management Discoveries, which um, Chris was introducing to you, I think is the, the youngest and newest journal represented in our panel here, and SEJ would be the second um, youngest. It's been around for about 10 years. Um, SEJ is a journal of the Strategic Management Society, so it's kind of a sibling journal of SMJ and uh, GSJ. And the way that we're structured, we have three co-editors instead of uh, a single editor-in-chief or executive editor. So it's myself, Gary Dishnitsky, and Chris Zott are the three co-editors. Uh, and then we have a great group of associate editors. Um, in the last year and a half or so, we've added a bunch, um, which are names that are probably familiar to you. Ben Campbell, Yong Lee, Dan Elfenbein, Ishan Guler, Anu Wadwa, and Peter Klein. Um, Peter Klein uh, is not only a wonderful AE, but also one of his papers won our uh, best paper award, which will be um, presented at SMS conference in Paris, if any of you are going to that. So our mission is to publish excellent work um, at the intersection of strategy and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I would say we define that fairly broadly. If you have good work that relates to entrepreneurship, we'd love to see it. Um, some of our accomplishments in recent years that we're excited about as a, a newer journal. Um, SEJ was added to the FT50 recently, um, which is, is great for visibility. We get about 300 submissions a year, or at least in the last year, and that's been tracking up every year. The acceptance rate's about six or seven percent. Um, there's different ways to calculate that, um, but it, it's somewhere around there. Um, we have special issues coming up on history in the study of entrepreneurship, on entrepreneurship in emerging economies, and one on meta-analyses. And so those two calls are, are still up. We have one that will be coming out that's sort of going through the review process right now on organizational design and entrepreneurship, which is, is really interesting. I want to put in, finally, a special pitch. Does anyone do qualitative research in this room? All right. So although I am a co-editor, and most of our manuscripts we um, send to the associate editors after an initial screen, but as a qualitative researcher myself, I am acting as associate editor for, at this point, almost all of the qualitative manuscripts 
um, that we get because we really see that as an area that is, is so important in entrepreneurship research and we're trying to um, get great reviewers and really take a developmental um, approach to qualitative work. So I hope you'll consider SEJ for your great case study uh, or interview-based research. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff McMullen, and I am an entrepreneurship scholar. Um, I say that somewhat jokingly because sometimes I feel like we have to apologize for it as if it's somehow we're second class citizens. I want to speak to you. The reason I love JBV and the reason I love this field is because I am a management scholar. Yes, that's true. But my heart is first and foremost entrepreneurship. Why do I share that with you? Because I think it transcends management and JBV transcends management. We, we, we overlap with management and we love all that management research, we'll take all that, but if you are not in management, if you're in econ, if you're in psychology, if you're in finance and accounting, we take those papers too and they will get reviewed by people that know finance, accounting, psychology, economics. I think it's important. I, I deeply believe that the journal needs to be a market, not a club. If your work is good work, if it's solid work, it's asking interesting questions, it will get a fair shake and it will get read by people who know that work, who care about that work, and it, they don't care where you're from. I'm not going to pay attention to what university you're from. If the work is the work is solid, it's interesting, it's impactful, it will get heard, it will get a voice. It will presumably, if, if at all possible, all the journal articles come into me and then I give them to a, a field editor that is the most appropriate field editor I can find. Somebody who believes in what you believe in and is studying that is, a, is as much a match as possible. If I feel like there is an area that's underrepresented or you feel like there's an area that's underrepresented, I'd like to hear about it because we need a field editor in that space that knows that. I, I, I want to eliminate biases in uh, entrepreneurship. I, I think if you're doing excellent work, you should have a chance to see that work read by people that care about those questions. Uh, and th that's something we're deeply committed to at, e at JBV. The reason, it, so far it's wor been working extremely well. I will say that Dean started much of this uh, years ago by taking a big tent approach, um, trying to be multi-contextual, multi-level, uh, multi-field. Uh, and I, I'd like to extend that. And, and if you look at our impact factor, it's gone up every year. Uh, we're up to 6.0 this year. It was excellent. AMJ was at 6.7. Uh, just to give you comparison, uh, we competed really well against all the unequivocal A's in strategy and OB. We were higher than them in impact factor. It's not the only statistic, by the way. So when people say the gate impact factors can be gamed, which is very difficult, by the way, um, it, it that it, you can compare the other metrics too. We compete there. I'm telling you this because I think it's important to realize you don't have to say, I'm a strategy scholar who does work in entrepreneurship. I'm an OB scholar who does some work in entrepreneurship. You can say, I'm an entrepreneurship scholar and I'm proud of it because I do world-class research. I think that's, that's the message. That's my number one message. It's even more important than JBV. JBV will stand by that and, and we will continue to make sure that that holds true. So when you're work is published in JBV, if it's evaluated by people outside, they're going to they're read that article and say that's an excellent article. Um, it's, it's both thoughtful, it's relevant, and it's rigorous. Uh, and we're, we don't want to sacrifice on either of those. A couple quick things. Um, JBV's been around since 85, so we're not as old as ETMP. Uh, I love ETMP. Ray Bagby's one of my closest friends, and so is Candy. Um, I will say that we, uh, just a couple final, uh, we, we do have special issues coming out. We have had a couple on pro-social organizing, one on experimental methods that's in, underway, and one under well-being. We've been judicious historically on special issues just because there are issues with special issues um, that sometimes things come in the back door and the, and the process isn't the same. Uh, I'm open to proposals from you all. If you have a really interesting proposal that you feel like could create a toehold or, or um, give leadership to a movement that's already out there and you would like to submit that, we give a proposal the same kind of review that you would give an article. Largely, it goes to like three field editors. They give feedback to me, and then I write up a letter to that extent. So I invite those proposals. Um, we, again, I uh, pretty sparse on the ones we accept because I just don't want to fill the journal with special issues and only special issues. If it's on entrepreneurship, you're going to give a fair shake anyway. You don't need a special issue to do that. The special issue should be to consolidate a voice and get a community going, and that's kind of the idea behind that, or to give a voice to a community that didn't have one before. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to any questions that you might have. Uh, one final thought. 
we accept qual qualitative papers, theoretical papers, quantitative papers. If it's on entrepreneurship, we're interested in it. And that's, it's that simple. If you hear otherwise, then contact me directly and I will set the record straight. I, I've written in each of those areas. So trust me, um, if, if we're not, then I'm cutting my I'm cutting my own legs out from under me because I work in each of those areas as well. So I want to see your work in any of those areas. Critical studies. If it's out there, I'm still interested. I think it's cool. Um, if, it's, if, if it's pushing the boundaries, it's entrepreneurial. It's entrepreneurship research. We want to see it. I'll stop because I'm monopolizing. So thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, the editors. May I give you five minutes to just have an informal conversation in the group so that we don't get uh, the first question or you don't get out socialized by the people who ask the first question to raise some issues informally and then go to the editors. And may I also ask editors, the doctoral students in the room, if you could advise them about reviewing and how to serve the field and enter the field as well uh, when you get to this. We give them a couple of minutes and they'll come back to you. Hi, uh, we had a question at our table uh, about AMJ and the uh, uh, comment that AMJ are going to speak to multiple audiences. And um, we were a bit cu curious because a lot of AMJ articles we read are on specific, uh, either the theory or phenomena, uh, let's say human research management or more OB or social network analysis or more strategy. So that seems already to imply a specific audience. And um, so we, we were wondering, is then the theory that should be general and could be used by multiple audiences? Or is it more a phenomenon that multiple audiences are interested in? It, it can be all of these things. When I say it should be appealing to, to a broader audience, it means the question that you're asking is for a more fundamental character so that other people get inspiration for it. So when you let me give you a concrete example, because otherwise it's, it, it remains too fluffy. I had a paper on identity and entrepreneurship. You know, and this, is, this is a paper where I looked at founder identities and how that imprinted the firm you know, and the, the emerging venture. So from that perspective, this was a new lens. Of course, there was social identity research for the last 30 years or so. Huh? But, but the particular way in looking at this had then many other implications for back to identity research, you know, because it's, it was a novel type of context, these emerging ventures, how they shape organizations. It had implications for organizational identity research. So it, it was a, an entrepreneurship paper, but it has multiple implications that move beyond entrepreneurship. You know, and they, these are audiences, the org, org theorists, org behavior, um, identity theorists, uh, social psychologists that, that uh, can be addressed with this paper. So in that sense, there was a broader readership. Yeah? Um, let me make another comment with, uh, regarding this, because oftentimes what I see as an editor is we get papers where the framing is too narrow, while the scholar could have framed it more broadly. What do I mean by that? So if you, if you study entrepreneurship, you see that serial entrepreneurs are quite good in framing their ventures, looking at the venture from multiple sides and not only being like a hamster in a wheel. They look from the venture to the outside. That's what, what many studies looking at the entrepreneurial mindset have shown. You know, and I think in a similar way, a good scholar can look at his paper from multiple perspectives and, and basically switch it around and say, hey, if I frame it that way, maybe there's a more general contribution there. Yeah? As an editor, I can help shaping you know, that, that rough diamond, if you want to say so. Yeah? But I need to see first if there's something. Yeah? Uh, I can help you shaping the paper to become more broader. Yeah? But, but I would like to see an attempt that, that, that there is something in there that can be more broader, because oftentimes, you know, if, if the diamond is too, too much buried into the soil, I, you know, I don't have too much digging equipment to, to get this out. <laughs> I've also limited time. No, but, but, but that means, you know, I think for, for many entrepreneurship papers, you can apply this logic to say, Maybe there's something more general. Maybe I can look at it from a different angle. Maybe I can use this as a context. Oftentimes, uh, entrepreneurship is a great context to study things that are not studyable in, in, in large organizations. So give me another example. I did a lot of research on opportunity identification. This is something where in an entrepreneurial setting, you have three, four people. You know, can measure their prior knowledge. You can understand what they identified, etc. If you would study the same phenomenon in a large organization, this would be quite different because there are 30 people in a department, they talk to another 50 people, and suddenly this is extremely messy. Yeah? So even if we want to 
inform more general management research, I think entrepreneurship provides a nice setting. Yeah? But that means also as well that you need to understand your, your paper probably in a, in a different way. And that's where, where I think it's, it's actually a beautiful <laughs> process to be able to shape and turn your paper as you want, because that means you really understand your topic. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I mean, sort of any of you, you all could could answer this, but I'm curious. Um, when, when you're making the decision as the editor, given that no paper is perfect and and uh, sort of the best cases R and R, minus I think Kathy Eisenhart said one of her 89 papers was accepted in first round. But other than that, and I'm not Kathy Eisenhart. Um, <laughs> What, what in, in a paper really makes you think, I'm willing to give the, the writers of, of this um, more opportunity? I mean, sometimes it's like, okay, uh, yes, we're AMJ and we want theory, but I like the back end and so extend the th theory. Or sometimes, oh, your theory's right, but you need to work on the empirics. What, uh, what really calls to you when you're making that decision to give the, the writers the latitude to get a revision? So I, I think it depends a little bit also whether you're more of a general management theory or more of the um, entrepreneurship specific um, specific areas. But you know, when I look at a paper and I've overridden my reviewers, um, but I look to see, is this interesting? Is this something novel? Is this something that I didn't know before I read this paper? Did it make me go, aha? Right, and um, and 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 I look for that first, and then I I agree with Mark, and again AMR has a very similar right. We're a general management journal, so you have to do something or tell me something that takes what you've learned from this particular aha that now translates back into the broader literature somehow. Um, I also look for under theorized areas. Again, some of that might be a function of being entrepreneurship, and not that if I get whatever, because it's an under-theorized area, I'm, I'm willing to, to say yes, but I'm actually willing to maybe go a little extra mile to try and help develop that if I can. Um, but again, there has to be something really interesting. So just because it's under-theorized doesn't, right? It has to be something that makes me sit back and say, you know, I didn't think about this before I read this paper. And the paper could be rough. And I've got one of those, by the way, right now. That's, that's, I told the author to sort of get out of his or her way. Um, but their core premise changed the way I thought about things. So. And so I'll repeat, Sharon, um, something interesting. In other words, what is an interesting question but besides that, um, because ETP publishes both um, empirical and theoretical papers, we look for novel insights into theory and novel data sets that might shed light on some new phenomenon or might be of interest for exploration. So, uh, you know, sort of building on what Sharon just said, um, you know, is there something there that makes you say, I didn't know that before and I've never thought about that and this is a real novel insight for what we think about in the field or it's a novel data set that might really shed light on something that we haven't we didn't know before so the Murray Davis that's interesting is something that I'll repeat and I'm sure Mark and everybody on the panel will probably say that as well so I'll pass that to Mark okay. I already spoke so so uh, I agree with what's already been said. I was just going to add a, a couple other things. Um, so when you're an editor and you're trying to decide whether to give a paper an R and R, whether it's at the first stage or even if it's you know already a revision and you're trying to decide on a second R and R, you think about the the cost of doing that to um, the reviewers and especially to the authors. So there's an assessment of, okay, if the authors go back and put a lot of work into this and I ask the reviewers to look at it again, um, what's the probability that this is going to 
amount to something. And so you're making a combination of judgments about uh, what's the current state of this manuscript, but there's also this very subjective piece about um, how, how good do I think, or how capable do I think these authors are. And so one way that you can signal that is just with the writing. You know, just make sure that your paper is well written because that gives the editor more confidence that you're going to be able to pull this off. Um, the second piece of that, which is particularly important for qualitative papers, is the data. So qualitative papers that are taking an inductive approach, it's very common for the framing to change quite a bit during the review process. So I, I don't really expect um, with a qualitative manuscript that they necessarily have the right framing um, in the first round, because I know as an author I usually don't. But I do want to see that they've collected a significant amount of data. If they've done interviews, have they interviewed the right people that would actually you know, have information about what it is that they are studying? Um, and if, if there's a really good data set, then I'm inclined to, to give them a chance to revise um, because you know, if, if you've got a really good qualitative data set, there's almost always something interesting that can be teased out of it. It's a tough one to go last on. Um, I, I guess I would just add a couple things. Is it timely and relevant? What I mean by that is I, I, I'm a voracious reader, just obsessive, got to have new information. I read about 200 books a year on average. For real, on, on every topic, and there's no way that I could gauge everything of what's interesting. So what I look for, are there fatal flaws in it? Will the data support some of the claims that are made? And then I'm going to try to find a field editor that, that is a specialist in that particular area, because what is interesting is socially constructed. Um, it, there is no objective answer to what is interesting. So what is interesting to me is going to be different to somebody who's a specialist in that particular area and knows what the boundaries are and what the knowledge frontier is. So it's important that I think it's interesting as a general reader, and then they find it interesting as a specialist in that particular area, but they know it's not just reinventing the wheel. So it's going to go through that process to some extent. And and then I, I did a, a lot of the answers that were given in the sense that, it, you know, you, you can see, is the writing going to be able, are these authors going to be able to deliver? If the writing is just, it needs a translator in what the first pass before that should have already happened and it hasn't happened. There might be good science there, but I can't even get to it. Um, the writing's so poor in some cases. By the way, that's not a statement about being a native English speaker or not. I have native English uh, speaker friends that hire copy editors because they know the writing needs work, that it's all passive voice. I don't know what, what, where's the subject, you know, uh, you know what's, who's doing what to whom. You know, that's, uh, they know that, and they're, they're willing to make that investment and pay because they know that matters. If the, if the reader can't read the paper, they can't even judge the, or evaluate whether it's a rigorous design and all that. They're not going to make that effort. Um, people are doing this for free. You're doing this for free. You're reviewing each other's papers. If you're a reviewer and you get a paper and there's, missed, and there's typos and, and grammar errors all in the abstract, you've already made a big decision whether you know it or not. Now you're going to read for an hour or two and rationalize the decision you've already made, which is that this paper probably doesn't deserve an R&R. &R. So there is no field. You are the field. What do you do in that situation? How are you going to respond to a poorly written paper that comes across your desk? Are you going to give it the benefit of the doubt when you have five other things to do and you know a million things going on? Or are you going to read that paper when it's polished and they've made some mistakes, you're going to give the benefit of the doubt in that case, right? Because you feel like this person really did the best they could and it looks like with a little bit more, there could be something here. So make sure you, you send in your best quality work if you want to give it a shot. You're asking, people, you're asking three people and an editor to give up their Saturday, probably. That's how I think about it. That's a big ask. And they're all doing it voluntarily. That means they're not spending some time with their family, their kids, whatever, a hobby, whatever they're doing. They're giving it to you to read your paper and give feedback. So you want to make sure you give them your best effort when you send that in because that's, I mean, that's just that's the right thing to do. And so if you do that, then it's hard to really argue. I mean, if it comes back and you get three poor reviews or they say it's not interesting, you, know, you, you did your best shot. You at least know the ideas were evaluated, not some trivial garbage. Then, then people rationalize and, and make an excuse of why they rejected the paper. 
So I, it's not what you want to hear because it puts the burden back on the, the author. But ultimately, the, author, the burden's always mine. It always comes back to me as the author. Right? If I don't make it clear, even if they didn't get it, it's still my fault as the author um, in the end. And it's just a, it's an accountability check that it's painful, but it's, it's the nature of what we do. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is a more general question, really. So, so what in terms of, you know, because um, before uh, Howard Alder said, you know, you should always aim high, you know, start at the top, et cetera. And what it, so then, you know, you give, you've given it your best shot and you get reviews and, you know, they are, I don't know, they kill your paper or whatever. So, so and then what do you do with those reviews if it's rejected, right? So if it's an R&R, you're going to try and solve everything. But if it's, um, but if it's a reject, to a journal, do you still, what would be your recommendation? Like, do you try to solve these issues nevertheless? Do you, or do you think, okay, I'm gonna, you know, so if there's some obvious flaws pointed out, of course you're gonna deal with them, but how much time would you spend on the paper before you then go and give it another shot, basically? So I'm gonna give a short answer to this and then I'll, I'll pass it on to others, but um, I have come to believe that there are times when a rejection is a blessing. It's a gift, and the reason is if you have reviewers that just don't get what you're doing and want you to take the paper in a different direction, then I would rather know that and have the paper be rejected. We have you know, multiple good journals, and then you have the opportunity to look at the feedback, and you have to give it a fair shake. You have to say, okay, you know, they were right about this, and I can fix that, but you can also say, they were wrong about this, or it's not the audience I want to speak to, and you know I'm not going to do that particular piece. If you get an R and R, you kind of have to deal with all of it. So nobody likes to get a rejection, but you know when that happens, I think you you need to try and see the silver lining, which is I don't have to do everything that they're suggesting, which is kind of liberating. There's an ad <clears throat> additional aspect to this, which is the fit with the journal. You know, some papers we get uh, don't just don't fit the journal very well, you know, because the conversation happens elsewhere. It might be too narrow, it might be too, too less theoretical for AMJ, you know, but it would, would fit elsewhere. So in that sense, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way the author's task before he or she submits or before that team submits to to actually figure out if that journal presents a good fit and and in order to do this you engage with the journal you read the journal often it's a good indication if the conversation that you want to join is, is happening at that journal so you look at the types of papers you're citing and if there's uh, only amj papers then that's a strong signal that there's the conversation uh, if it's no AMJ paper in my case, you know, then you might say, oh, maybe it's not happening there. You know, maybe that is, there's a reason why this conversation is not happening there. You know? So in that sense, um, make sure that you also know the, your target journals, you know, if, uh, the types of flavors, the types of, of ways they write, uh, the, these papers are written, etc. You know? So I actually want to piggyback a little bit on something Jeff said earlier and and a little bit of what Mark is saying the reason it is so important for the Academy journals to have reviewers and to have an editorial board that reflects who you are is because if you're at any kind of a decent school I shouldn't say it that way. If you're at a research, if you're at a, at a research intensive school, and you want to make tenure, you probably have to have at least one of those publications. And so, to echo what Jeff said, you want to make sure that there are people on that editorial team, that there are people on that editorial review board, who are in a position to fairly evaluate your work because Jeff's right, things are socially constructed. And, and so you, you wanna make sure you have that. Now, if you do that, if you make sure 
that that's where you want to go and that you're actually getting a fair shake and you get rejected. And by the way, rejection, um, I've heard Jay say this numerous times, rejection is certain, publication is rare, right? So chances are you're going to get rejected, especially if you come to AMJ or AMR, right? I mean, the rejection rates are high. But what you hope is that you get really good quality, insightful reviews. And you take those reviews and you look at them. Some people are better at, at taking things and not taking them personal. Some people have to put them away for a while. Um, but you look at the reviews and you say, OK, here's what I can fix. Here's what I don't want to fix. Here's what I want to hold on to. And here's what I can't fix. And you revise it. Now, you revise it, right? Because the last thing you want, and I've had this happen to me as a reviewer, the last thing you want is to get reviewed at JBV and rejected and then have the paper sent to ETNP and have it go to the same exact reviewer that just rejected your paper and you haven't made any changes. That really makes me mad. Right? As a reviewer, that makes me really angry. And so how likely are, do you think I am to say, this is a great paper, maybe we should give it an R&R &R to the editor? Zero. So change it. Make the changes. Look to see. You know, the reviewers, and maybe it's, you just have to clarify things, but make the changes. Make some changes at least. I was going to mention the same thing, but I'll, I'll say something different because <laughs> Sharon just said it. Um, one thing uh, tactically is that when you get the feedback, um, again, read it, get angry, put it in a drawer, write all the comments that you want to back just to get it out of your system, and then come back and reread the reviews and really think about what, they, what they're saying. Um, the, the editor's comments are going to frame what the reviews you know, sort of the, the whole story of the paper. And they'll usually let you know that there is a serious problem, that you really need to fix this. It's the theory, it's the data set, whatever it is, or fit, as, um, as was mentioned, because fit's very important. Um, but then after that, you can figure out sort of what's editorial and maybe what's not editorial. Then, if you're a junior person, I would take it to a senior person on your faculty or somebody that you've worked with and have them take a look at the reviews with you. Because in the end, like Melissa said, it's your choice to figure out what to fix and what not to fix and where to direct that, that piece of work. But it's, sometimes it's really helpful to have somebody else take a look at the reviews and help you determine you know, how serious the problems are and whether you need to reanalyze the data or whether you have the, an incorrect theory or whether you need to collect more data or whatever it might be. So sometimes a senior person can help you figure that out. Question? In, in, Mark, you want to you want to add something, Mark? He does no. Now. No. No. <laughs> Let's hear another question. Hi. Um, as a PhD student, for example, at our university, we we have the choice of uh, going for a compilation thesis where you have to write papers. Um, my question is, how much bargaining power as a PhD student you have over the uh, the pathway you take in your papers. For example, um, your four papers or five papers have to make sense together, they have to speak to each other, and if the reviewers want to take you in a different direction, that is totally not uh, syncing with your PhD. How, how do you go about this and how, how much bargaining power you have with the editors or with the reviewers to, um, to try to pull them back to the direction you're taking, uh, which works well with your PhD. Thank you. I can give it a shot. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think the question needs to be rephrased. How much bargaining power do you have you with your PhD commission? Because I, you know, if, if you come to me and say, Gruber, I have this paper, and you tell me to go in this direction. I back this up. You know, this is my opinion. This is the opinion, oftentimes, of the reviewers too. And and we think there might be a, a stronger contribution in that direction. You can say, I don't care about this. I do it the other way. You so resubmit, and well, let's see what happens. But um, you know, I would go to to your commission. And say, look, I have this revision with ETPS, EJMJ, whatever. 
this is a great opportunity. This is a fantastic signal for my future career because I'm only a PhD student right now. We are, you know, there are few PhD students who publish in these journals. I have this great opportunity. Give me advice. What shall I do? And that's how I would, uh, I would approach it. You know, don't, don't start the fight with the journal you know, because it's not our job to make sure that you get a dissertation. Both doctoral students yes. and how they can come into the system as reviewers and how they can serve among the various journals and how they should go about the reviewing really quickly and then we can end the session. Yeah, so very quickly, I was, Sharon and I were having an offline conversation about the extent to which we use, you know, AMR and, and ETP use PhD students as reviewers and mostly we do not. And so, um, because when you submit to the system, if you've submitted a paper, we know that you've submitted a paper. If you get something published, you do. But we would rarely use PhD students unless you were a content expert, say you're a mathematician, you really understand FSQCA or whatever it might be, and we need a third or fourth review where we might add that person or crowdsourcing, as Sharon mentioned. Um, so how do you get into the system and how do you get experience? Well, a good place to start is with like this meeting because this meeting always needs reviewers. Um, other conferences require reviewers as well. And so you can practice in those areas. And then when you have completed your PhD, you can let one of the editors know that you've finished your PhD, you're joining XYZ school, and then um, we can bring you on as an ad hoc reviewer um, into our system. So that's my short answer. You know, but I am going to also give you an example. This was this was when I was a editor at SCJ actually, and we did a special issue, and um, somebody had contributed to the special issue, and it was a pretty it was a pretty specific point that they had made, and I had another paper, and I wanted them to review the paper, and that person wrote back to me and said. I'm an assistant professor and I don't have time to review for you because I'm too busy working on my own papers. Yeah, and what was your reaction? Not good. Was Mine like, wasn't so good either. Why should we publish your paper? Yeah, why should we, right? So one of the things that I think is also important to remember is, you know, and it's easy to say, oh, I didn't want to review for, for Academy. I wanted to review for, you know, the big journals. But you have to be part of the community first. We are a community, we're a community of scholars, and you have to be a member of that community first. And you will become established. And let me tell you, I sat next to Mike Hitt this morning. Mike Hitt was a full chaired professor when I was a doctoral student. And now I'm sitting next to him. You guys will all be sitting where we are sitting, hopefully sooner rather than later, right? So you have to build community. You have to be a community of scholars. And you have to remember that when you're reviewing too, right? You, you cannot judge people's work by your own aspirations, right? So you have to be a good reviewer. You have to be a good community member. Maybe one thing that might not be so apparent to you that we as editors, we evaluate the reviews as well. You know, we get your reviews, and at AMJ we have a five-point system. One is excellent, maybe a future candidate for the editorial review board, you know, and one is, you can guess what it is. Eh? Uh, and if you have a one, uh, it will be stored in the system. If it's a five, it will be stored in the system, and the system nowadays doesn't forget. You know? So if you have aspirations, you know, to become a reviewer, to join the editorial review boards, it pays off to spend time on the reviews, to constructive, positive reviews. You know, there's different types of languages you can use. I tend to see if, in case, I, I rarely send out to PhD students, but if, uh, if I do, I, I send to those where I have some uh, feeling, understanding that they are positive, because PhD students tend to be a bit harsh sometimes. Yeah? Um, and, and you need to know that there's no perfect study. You know, there's always something in any study you can read, even the published ones where you say, you could have done it better. But that's normal, you know, you're doing something innovative as a scholar and you cannot foresee all the major problems that will happen, you know. Uh, so there might be some problems that you can, you know, address with a, with a very, you know, in a constructive way where say as a, as a reviewer, well, you can do this estimation technique or you can do this robustness check and then this problem is gone, you know, and there are other problems that might persist. Um, 
but but make sure to understand that this is you know the perfect study never exists and uh, try to understand a second thing which is don't be dogmatic in, 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 in your worldviews in the sense that if there's a study that's fairly new, maybe the methods are not perfect, the methods are credible so you can trust the result and that's all we need. Yeah? It doesn't have to be always the Kolmogorov, Smirnov, Gruber, Alvarez and, and uh, Candy Brush uh, estimator. You know? It can be different types of estimators you use to come to a trustworthy result. I just have one small thing. A, a really great review does more than just say what's wrong with the paper. Um, anybody can do that. That's Sam Rayburn, the, the old house, the speaker from, from Texas, used to say, any jackass can knock down a barn. It takes a carpenter to build one. So, I mean, it, it's easy to say what's wrong with a paper. A, a truly great review actually does that and then stops and says, what would I do? What, what could I suggest to fix the paper? And when you read those, you're like, oh, now this is somebody who took some time. They wrote a good review. I mean, they really, because that's hard. I mean, it, that, it requires sitting down and thinking about their paper, actually putting yourself in the shoes of the author, going and being empathic enough to do that and go, can this be salvaged? What could be done? And not to be commanding, of course, if, if you can do it, like if you could actually come up with two things and go, I, I mean, these are just suggestions, you know, and frame it that way, then, then it becomes clear that you're not telling the person what paper to write. You're just thinking, here's some possible ways that this could be salvaged. That's a great review. So if you can do that, I, I, I know it takes more time. It's more effort. Don't worry. You're not giving up your research ideas. I, you know, people know in time that it's not as, there's, there's not the curtain that you would think. I mean, a give, giving people... The community knows in time that you're a giver. If, if you're somebody who gives ideas, helps people, nurtures that, it gets out. Um, so it, it's not just given. You're not just being exploited or used. And I, so so it, you're not going to give away your precious idea. If you only have one idea, by the way, you need a new career. Um, you know, I mean, it, hopefully you can come up with more than one idea in this business. So. Try to be generous like that, and it will come back around. You'll, you'll, you'll actually stimulate your own research because it'll force you to actually think things through that you hadn't thought of before because that wasn't really your stream of thought. You picked up somebody else's stream of thought, tried the hat on, saw if you could extend it a little bit, and you thought about something in a different way than you probably would have ever thought about it before. So I look at it like that. It makes reviewing a lot more fun, too, because then it becomes a creative act not just an absolutely critical act, which is draining and exhausting and tiring, um, but you, you get that part done, and then you have some fun with it, and you're like, here's what, here's what could really be interesting if, if you're able to do it, if you have the data, if you have the theory, whatever, if you have the time, the interest. Last words. Um, so uh, I, I think a lot of great points have been made. I would just add, for those of you that are doctoral students, um, so number one, I, I wouldn't rush into reviewing because it actually you know, does take a lot of time and it's not such a bad thing to wait until you, you know, have a job. To, you, know, you can certainly review for the academy, um, but once you're sort of you know, either a very senior doctoral student or assistant professor, talk to your advisor and say, hey, I, I'm interested in doing some reviewing because senior people in the field, and I'm sure everyone on this panel um, has been asked to do many, many reviews, and you do get to a point where you're on a bunch of editorial boards, maybe you're an associate editor, and you get more requests than you can feasibly do. And so that's the point where I would think, oh, I'm getting, a, someone's asking me to review this paper, I happen to know my doctoral student is studying this topic, and is you know an expert on the state of the art. And so I'm gonna decline this review, but I'm gonna suggest my doctoral student who's you know, about to graduate or maybe as a um, assistant professor would be a great substitute. And so that's, you know, one pathway where you can start getting involved as a reviewer. Okay, Th uh, may I thank the editors for their time uh, and uh, that was <laughs> May I also recognize the other editors in the room, Gary, who's hiding back there, my brother Phil, who is the field editor at JBB, and the newest chief editor, uh, the youngest chief editor, uh, I should say, in tenure uh, compared to the others, yes, uh, on the chief editorship. Jay, so uh, thank you all for joining us. If you have questions about org science or other journals or AMR along with Sharon, please feel to catch them before they dash off. 
And we have a, a social at 5.30, which is across the road. One second, we'll pull up the location for the social that we go to. And uh, we welcome you to join us at the social as well. Huh? Thank you again. Thank you.